Hey, and welcome back for another look at the X-Files. Today we're diving into a real banger of an episode, Pusher, episode 17 of season 3. Pusher places our agents on the path of a serial killer with the ability to make his victims take their own lives through sheer willpower alone. The episode begins and already I'm depressed because of how affordable things were back in the 90s. Robert Patrick Modell is doing a little light shopping, but I would not be touching these nasty ass protein shakes. Hey, it's our buddy Fluke Man. Looks like he's enjoying his retirement in Martha's Vineyard. Modell isn't a stupid man and he knows he's being followed, so let's get this party started. Federation, get down! Get down! Get down! Turn this thing off. Agent Frank Burst has been on the trail of the man simply known as Pusher, and he's finally got him. So that must mean the episode is over then, right? Unfortunately it isn't, and even though Modell may look rather unassuming, he does have a rather interesting ability. Cerulean. I don't know what Modell is thinking here, but those knees are going straight through his head. Frank, looking all banged up, has made his way to Mulder and Scully, because what just happened really makes no sense, and who better than the FBI's most unwanted to help out? The officer driving the car somehow managed to free Modell before dying to his injuries, and Modell somehow didn't have his head caved in with his own legs. Prior to the incident, Modell would call Agent Burst and confess to being responsible for a bunch of contract killings, except they could never pin anything on him because all these killings appeared to be suicides. So you think that Pusher somehow talked him into doing this? He willed him into doing that? Willed him? Oh. So Modell's weapon of choice is peer pressure? They then find some bloody letters left on the police cruiser, and when the image is flipped, it seems to say Ronin, although Mulder has to actually Frank and tell him it's Ronin, a samurai without a master. You know, I've looked everywhere, but this is the one and only time I've ever heard anyone pronounce it Ronin, so I think Mulder is in the wrong. Anyways, they start flipping through some American Ronin magazines, which if it were real, I would assume would only be for the biggest badasses interested in martial arts, guns, and women. Ew. A young agent named Holly comes in with more magazines and like a child, Scully just stares at her bruised face until she eventually tells the agents that she was mugged. I mean, this guy calls himself Pusher. Can't we take that to mean that he pushes his will onto other people? Mulder discovers something interesting when he finds a random ad placed in the back of each magazine, which seems to coincide with the time span all the murders Modell confessed to. The agents decide to spend the night watching and calling a payphone, as it's one of the numbers found in the ad. They nearly give up, but after Scully drools on Mulder a bit, the payphone starts to ring. Alright, where's my next breadcrumb? Right in front of you. Let your fingers do the walking, G-Man. Let your fingers do the walking. Let your fingers do the walking. Modell thinks this whole thing is a game and spent the whole night watching the agents, but he claims he's far away so no sense in looking for him, but how could he be watching them and also be far away? Unless he has some high powered telescope, I'm not buying it mister. What he said about letting your fingers do the walking does give Mulder an idea and he checks the last number the payphone called out to, which happens to be a golf pro shop. So can you guess where they're going? Modell is hitting a few with the boys when his eagle eye vision notices the sharpshooter out in the distance. One of the police finds Modell hiding out in a storage room and let's see him talk his way out of this one. <laughs> oh wait. I need you to do something for me. Will you do something for me? Hey, what's he doing with that lighter and gasoline? Modell talks the officer into setting himself on fire, which has to be one of the worst ways to go. But how did he lose all his hair? A car horn gets Mulder's attention, and he finds Modell nearly passed out in his car. Seems talking people into self-immolation is really exhausting. Modell is brought to court, but on what charges? He didn't exactly do anything. Mulder takes the stand and tells the judge he thinks Modell willed all of his victims into killing themselves. And as soon as he does, Scully gives her, Ah shit, here we go again, look. Modell claims his confession to the murders was nothing more than a drunken phone prank, but there's no way the judge is going to take that seriously. I believe you owe me five dollars. Oh, I guess he did. Well, maybe not exactly because Modell was playing a little mind game with the judge. Anyways, Frank Burst knows his name and address now, so Modell's going to be watched a lot closer than ever before. You know, Mulder could probably give some marksmanship lessons to Luis. 
Scully comes in with some fun information about Modell and how he failed getting into the FBI. Did you know that he applied to the FBI? He didn't even come close to passing the psych screening. I don't think I'd come close either, if we're being honest. During the screening process, he got caught in a bunch of lies, one claiming he was a master of martial arts, and another that he was trained by ninjas in Japan. What he really is, though, is a master in Bushido. Mulder actually thinks that maybe he is a master of some kind of martial art, but Scully puts it perfectly when she says he's just a little man who wishes he were someone big. Meanwhile, Modell makes his way to the FBI and is let in without barely any hesitation because he simply wrote pass on a piece of paper. Also, is that Dave Grohl, former member of Nirvana and creator of the Foo Fighters? Well, yes it is, along with his then-wife Jennifer Youngblood. And interestingly, in the previous episode, Apocrypha, when Mulder is speaking to the well-manicured man, he mentions Foo Fighters, so I'm thinking this might be an X-File in and of itself. Modell convinces Holly to let him access the computer system, when Skinner walks by and notices that something is up, because why are all of these blinds shut? We're in the middle of something here, so... Who are you and what are you doing here? Take a walk, Mel Cooley! <laughs> Who are these people that think they can talk back to Skinner? To get out of this sticky situation, Modell uses his shining to convince Holly that Skinner was the man who attacked her. So she gives him an eyeful of pepper spray and then kicks the shit out of him. But what is with season 3 and Skinner getting his ass beat? There's no way she's getting fired though. I mean Mulder attacked Skinner once before as well and nothing happened to him. But she claims it wasn't her. It was like she was out of her body and Modell had full control. I'm just gonna use that excuse the next time I beat my boss and see what happens. I reviewed the building security tapes. Modell can clearly be seen entering and leaving unnoticed. He had the word pass on his lapel. Mulder thinks Modell is responsible for Skinner's injuries and in a shocking turn of events, so does Scully. The only thing Modell seemed to be interested in was a file on Mulder, but before Modell can use any of his newfound information, the FBI bust down the door to his apartment. There doesn't appear to be much inside his place, but it really doesn't take much to make us guys happy. He does have a ton of those nasty protein shakes though, and yet I've never seen him hit the gym. Scully searches his medicine cabinet and finds some medication for seizures because Modell suffers from epilepsy. Oddly, the prescription seems to date back to when the murder started. Scully briefly mentions a few reasons why he would suddenly be suffering from epilepsy, including a brain tumor, and this triggers Mulder because according to him, brain tumors are often linked to psychic ability. Just bear with me for a second. What if Modell's suggestive ability is really a form of psychokinesis? Mulder, there's no such thing as ghosts or psychokinesis. Mulder theorizes Modell is actually dying, hence why they're able to catch him so easily at the golf pro shop, and maybe he just wants to go out with a bang. Literally. Modell's phone rings and Frank picks it up, while his men try and get a trace on the line. Oh, I bet that call's coming from inside the house. Mulder and Scully pick up the other phone so they can listen in, and now that everyone is here, Modell can have a little fun. About how much do you weigh? Anything to keep you talking, you piece of... I don't know, about 190, 195. Modell spends the next minute or so talking about how fat and unhealthy Frank is and somehow causes Frank to have a heart attack. I understand talking someone into setting themselves on fire or driving into a truck, but how do you talk someone into having a spontaneous heart attack? Well regardless, Frank is dead and they're nowhere closer to catching Modell. But with Frank out of the picture, Modell sees Mulder as a more fitting adversary, almost like Mulder is Batman to Modell's Joker. Modell seems to think they won't be able to find him because he placed a call from another payphone. However, he made one fatal error. The phone he called from is also nearby the hospital where he gets his medication. The agents and officers make their way to the hospital, but did Modell make a mistake or is this just another sick game in a long line of sick games? I'll go on Mike, that way you'll know what he's doing, where he is at all times. You got a radio, so I'm gonna keep my hands free. Mulder suggests he go in alone because if they don't, they risk the chance of Modell using the other armed men against one another. Scully and Mulder get very handsy with one another in this episode, and yet Chris Carter will insist nothing was going on. Mulder searches the hospital looking for Modell, and as much as I love Mulder, he really should hit the gym. A few gunshots are heard and Mulder finds two bodies. Some people claim this guy is Doug Hutchison, the actor who played Tombs, and he kinda looks like him, but I can't find anything that would suggest it is him. And plus, why would they cast one of their most recognizable antagonists in the show as a random hospital worker? Anyways, Modell has the guard's gun, but Scully notices something on the monitor. It apparently shows that Modell does have a tumor, and Mulder was right the whole time. Mulder? Mulder! 
Scully's now going in after Mulder, and she's so little. It looks like she's putting on her father's bulletproof vest. Scully finds Mulder and Modell, and it looks like they're going to take part in a little friendly game of Russian roulette. Modell goes on and on about Japanese warriors and martial arts. This guy wouldn't know the first thing about martial arts. Did they base Modell's character off Steven Seagal? Mulder takes the first shot at Modell and nothing happens. A second at himself and again, nothing happens. Then Modell makes Mulder point the gun at Scully. <laughs> Yeah, Mulder is not shooting Scully. Luckily, her quick thinking helped break Modell's hold on him. But something that I want to point out is Mulder keeps pulling the trigger despite the rest of the chambers being empty. This is what you're supposed to do when trying to take someone out. Maybe CSM's hitmen can take some notes. Anyways, I'm sure this is the last we'll ever hear of Mr. Modell. But again, these two are very handsy. Pusher is such a good episode and very underrated. I don't know why, but it's never talked about as much as something like Squeeze, yet I think it's just as good and maybe even better in parts. That ending alone is one of the most tense moments in the series, and even more so when it's your first time watching it. Modell is a really good villain, and part of what makes him so great is he has nothing to lose. He's already dying, so it doesn't matter if he's caught or even killed, so long as he brings some people down with him. It's all just a big joke for him, and in a sense, like I mentioned, he does feel jokerish in his motives. The cat and mouse game between himself and the agents is great, and I think this episode deserves more praise. Pusher was written by Vince Gilligan, and is his only writing credit for season 3. He wanted to focus on more of a cat and mouse style episode, where the agents would be confronted with a serial killer that liked to play games. According to the book The Complete X-Files, when Vince handed in his script for the episode, he told Chris Carter that this would be the best work I'm ever going to do for you. However, Chris didn't really believe that, because he felt a writer should try and outdo what they did last. Now, if only Chris had taken his own advice. Sorry, I kind of have a love-hate relationship with Chris Carter. The scene when Mulder gets fitted with the cameras prior to entering the hospital, he asks if this thing can pick up the Playboy channel. This little joke was actually changed from, can this thing pick up the Discovery channel? But because David knew Mulder had a thing for adult material, he decided to change it to something that would more suit the character. The Russian roulette scene at the end was nearly cut entirely. Apparently a few years prior, the film The Deer Hunter was shown on broadcast television, and because of its Russian roulette scene, some teens decided to try it for themselves, and I think you know how that ended. Fox's standards and practices were really just trying to cover their butts from any potential lawsuits, but with a little negotiating, aka money, they managed to keep the entire scene intact. Vince himself was even pretty astonished that they were able to show the entire scene without it being cut. It wasn't all sunshine and rainbows though, because Mitch Pelegi was starting to get frustrated that his character was always getting his ass kicked, and he said, I was feeling a little uncomfortable with him getting his ass kicked so much, and I think the fans were too. During the scene at the shooting range, Scully describes Modell as being a martial arts master, being trained by Gurkhas in Nepal, trained by ninjas in Japan, and telling self-aggrandizing lies. All of this was in reference to the master of Bullshito himself, Frank Dux. Frank Dux was the man who the Jean-Claude Van Damme film Bloodsport was apparently based off of. Well, his lies anyways. There's a ton of deep lore about the guy, from his claims of fighting in the Kumite, which was a fight to the death tournament he claimed he won, to working for the CIA and claiming to have all these military medals. Apparently around this time, his lies were starting to be exposed, so the X-Files was kind of taking a jab at it. The whole thing goes really deep, and I'm just going to throw allegedly over everything, because he's apparently very litigious. But if you want to know more about this insane man, I'm going to recommend a video from MMA YouTuber Napoleon Blown Apart called The Fake Fighting Fantasy of Frank Ducks. It's a really well done video and very entertaining, and I'll leave a link for that in the description. We have a couple of notable guest stars this week. First we have Vic Polizos as Agent Frank Burst. Vic is an American character actor mostly playing small roles in film and TV. He does a good job as Agent Frank Burst, but there's nothing really to say about his performance. He's believable, and I could see him as an actual FBI agent. He's been in a lot of stuff from B-movie schlock like Chud, to more well-known TV shows like Boston Legal. Looking at his credits, it seems like he got typecast because they're mostly law enforcement or lawyers. At 76 years old, he's still acting, although it looks like he mostly does dramatic podcasts these days. Robert Wisden played the insane Robert Patrick Modell. I want to quickly point out another coincidence with this episode, because has anyone noticed Modell's name is Robert Patrick Modell, and Robert Patrick, the T-1000 from Terminator 2, would join Season 8 as John Doggett? I'm just saying, it's kind of weird. 
Robert Wiseden wasn't actually their first choice for the role. Originally, Lance Henriksen was one of the actors up for consideration, but he would go on to star in Chris Carter's Millennium instead. While Vince's first choice was Harvey Firestein, but thankfully Robert's audition blew Vince away because can you imagine how those phone calls would have went with Harvey? Uh -huh. David, why did I just send my mother to Atlanta? David! Rob Bowman, the director, was really impressed by Robert's performance as well, saying, I thought Robert Wiseden was great as Pusher. He is a very energized, kind of confident actor with lots of ideas of his own. It took me about a day and a half to get him into it, and then I never had to speak to him again because he had that look in his eyes. I would walk up to talk to him about the scene, and I could see that he was already there. Robert does a good job and proves to be an amazing foil for Mulder. Outside of the X-Files, he's appeared in 29 episodes of Da Vinci's Inquest, Final Destination, and played Richard Nixon in the Zack Snyder comic book movie, Watchmen. Pusher currently sits at an 8.4 on IMDb, but I might have to go with a 9. Modell is such a great character, and that Russian roulette scene really can't be beat. Next up, we go from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows, when members of an archaeological dig begin to disappear, and the only explanation may be a vengeful jaguar spirit in the episode Teso Dos Bichos. So what do you think of Pusher? Did I prop it up too much, or does it deserve the praise? Anyways, I hope you're doing well. I'll hopefully see you in the next X-Files video, and please, stay spooky. He has the power to control your mind. He can make anyone do anything. <laughs> Even turn an FBI agent against his own partner. Pull the trigger, Mulder. Fight him. I'm gonna kill you. <laughs> A brand new X-Files, Friday at 9, 8 central.